folks today. I believe that this is going to be the best content, series-wise, maybe that we've done in a long time. And uh, I'm telling you, your life about to change forever. And we're going to get into all kinds of stuff regarding money. We're going to talk about budgeting and investing. We're going to get real practical as the series goes on. But I really want to get to your heart today. That's really my main goal. That's, that's my hope. And uh, we've deemed the series Secure the Bag. And uh, so hey, we're having some fun with it, but the, the, the terminology, the, uh, the, the language, uh, the Urban Dictionary, uh, which is my source for all good information after the Bible, uh, it says uh, that, that uh, securing the bag means acquiring or keeping something of value. How many would say money is valuable? Oh, all the safe folks are like, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to raise my hand. <laughs> Okay, money is valuable and it's important and it's okay. Uh, money answers things. Money moves the kingdom of God. Uh, it's okay to have money. Uh, it's okay to utilize money. Uh, the money is not the root of all evil, contrary to what you think you've heard or what you think you've read. The love of money is the root of all evil. And I really want to pull that apart a little bit today and help you understand uh, that it is okay and valuable to utilize the resources that God's give you or wants to give you. Uh, and God always uses resources and money and people. But when we love it, that's where we get in trouble. And, and so, man, I'm telling you, how many of you would just love to be secure uh, and to be victorious financially in your life? It's going to affect the generations uh, now and tomorrow. So it's really important. And uh, when I was a kid, uh, we'd go to restaurants and uh, I didn't have any concept of money. I was at my parents. So like as many refills as possible, just keep it coming. You know, like if I, we were eating wings or pizza, like just keep bringing the ranches and the blue cheese, you know, like just, just my finger just going like this, you know, like I didn't care, you know, but, but like now that I'm grown, I'm like, do, do the refills, like, are they free? You know, like, <laughs> I just want to make sure. Like, are the chips bottomless? Like, you can charge me $1.25 for salsa. I just want to make sure. I mean, I'm not, you know, whatever, right? Like, if, you're, if I'm with you and you're skinny, you should share with the skinny person next to you. You know what I mean? And I was like, you know, because we worry a little bit about money. Like, I'm grown now. I got bills. I got a kid. I got a wife who wants me to pay for things, you know? And I heard, a, I heard a lady say, amen. You know, she's a wife, you know? And I was like, like anyway, but, but there is a difference. Hear me on this. There's a difference uh, between stewardship and stress. There's a difference. So I don't believe, and I'm working on this, that we should, we should not live in constant fear or stress or anxiety or worry about money. We should, however, be careful and be good stewards, which is what we're going to teach you to do. But there's a difference between stewardship and stress. And here's what you need to know. God doesn't want us to worry about money as much as we do because he's not worried at all few amens. I know poor Richmond said amen. I know the people at home said amen. And you're going, Pastor Joey, like, that's easy for you to say, but God, did you see my bank account? Did you see all the minuses? Did you see how much I paid in school loans? All these different things, like, how am I not supposed to worry about this? Right? I mean, if you look at what's going on in our nation, right, school loans, uh, the average American has over $33,000 worth of school loans. Uh, credit card debt, 40% of Americans have an average of almost $10,000 in credit card debt, which is really bad debt, by the way. Average car payment is almost $500 a month for Americans. That's a lot of money right? Uh, average debt per age group, it varies, but you could be under 35. Average might be 67,000. Uh, when you're 75 and up, it's lower, 35,000. But in between those prime time years, it could be up to 133, 135,000 average American in that much debt. So God, excuse me if I'm a little bit worried, you know what I'm saying? Right? Uh, however, I want you to know this, and we'll get into this later in the series, why you can't miss a week, but there is actually some good debt. 
Yeah, some mortgages could be a good debt, could be, right? Leveraging debt or leveraging facilities or buildings, right? I mean, there could be some good debt. We'll get into that later. But overall, man, that debt is a weight and we don't want to be slaves to the lender, right? And so, but, uh, but you have to understand something that God is in the middle of all of this. The other day, this weekend, my buddy was in town and we went to go play football. Now, we are former college athletes. And I know when you look at me, that's what you see. You see <laughs> great strength and vigor and muscles and 31 inch waist. That's what you see. Why are you laughing? Right? So as we're going to play, I'm, I'm telling my friend, bro, it's in the bag. Like, we got this. Like, we're good. Like, we are standout athletes. Right? And of course, we showed up and we played and we looked foolish <laughs> and realized maybe I wasn't wearing a 31 after all. <laughs> you know, but here's what I know about God God is not a washed up college athlete. Like, God's got this. God's got your finances, He's got your life, He's got your future. It's in the bag. Like, like, God, like he's not worried like we are. And that's the title of my message today. It's in the bag at every location. Can you look at somebody next to you? Tell them it's in the bag. God's got this. God's got this. It's in the bag. Now, you don't believe me yet, but I'm going to walk you through the scriptures today. And by the end of the series, you will believe that God's got this. But you got to show up every week to know it. Now, I want to talk to you as a father today, as a dad today. I want to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through me as our Father God speaking to us. That's the image that I want to give you. I don't want to hoot and holler today. I want to be dad sitting in front of you, sitting and saying, hey, let's have a conversation. And I understand that some of us have not had good fathers. We've not had dads at all. We don't understand what it's like to have a healthy relationship with a dad. But I want you to know something. Even if you didn't have that, you've always had a good father. You've just not been aware of it. And so the father God is sitting with us today. And there's many times as I preach and there's many times as you read the scriptures where father God is sitting with his people and he's talking to them about relationships and he's talking to them about sex and he's talking to them about fear and their future and purpose and all these different things. Why would father God not sit with us and talk to us about our finances? Because as we get our finances healthy, sometimes it impacts all those other areas. So the posture that I want to take today at every location is Father God is sitting with his sons and daughters and saying, lean in. I want to teach you something about money. I want you to know that it's in the bag. Like, I got this, but you got to listen. You got to lean in. You got to trust me. And the first thing that I think Father God would say to you all today is this, that I am your source. It's me. You are not the source. Uh, you, you did not create the sun and the moon and the stars. You did not breathe life into man from rib did not come a woman. You did not create all these things. And listen to me, if I saved you, don't you believe that I can sustain you? I mean, do you believe that? Like I am the source. And some of you like God saving you was a whole lot bigger deal than God sustaining you. Trust me. We knew you before you were saved. You knew you before you were saved. Some of you are still in process of sanctification and like, wow, God is doing a work. Amen. Amen. And the fact that God sustained you, do you think that he would just, excuse me, the fact that God saved you, do you think he would just save you but not sustain you? God didn't just save you so that you'd get to heaven by the skin of your teeth. God saved you so that you would bring heaven to earth and make an impact. He's going to sustain you. Question is, do you trust him? Is your heart surrendered to the Father? Now, I want to go to a passage, Genesis chapter 22, verse 14, Abraham. He names the place Yahweh Yireh, or you might hear it as Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, what's powerful about this story is God has promised Abraham 
the generations. He's promised him the nations. He said, my purpose, the kingdom of God will flow through you. Now, Abraham is old, right? And he's past the child producing time, yet God gives him a son. A son, of course, is a seed, a seed for the generations. He says, as far as you can see, I'm gonna give you an inheritance. That's a big promise. And then God gives him this one son, and then God says, by the way, I know you love your son, but I need you to sacrifice him, kill him, if I can be completely straight up, and offer him back to me. And Abraham's going, hey, God, remember that one time you were going to give me lots of children, lots of grandbabies, lots of stuff? Well, like, like this kid, like he's the seed. How does this work? Well, what you need to understand about God being our source is that it doesn't make sense in our human mind. Like the kingdom of God is not sensible, friends. Yeah. It's just not. It's backwards. It's upside down. It's not earthly. And I'm grateful that I don't live in an earthly economy because though the economy's great right now, it may not be tomorrow, but I still live in a kingdom economy and he is Jehovah Jireh. So Abraham treks up the mountain and he's being obedient to God and he's trusting God with his first fruits, with his, the first thing, the thing that matters the most to him, the thing that he loves. And he picks up a knife and he's ready to slay his son because he loves God. And then God stops him because he is provider. And I think in Abraham's gut, he knew God had this. It was in the bag. Because God is not a liar and he's not a man that he should lie. If he makes a promise, he's going to keep it. And that's where you get this idea that he is provider. He is the source. If you look at 1 Chronicles, scriptures say both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all, and in your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. You understand that, like, it's not you that works, it's God's strength through you. Like, you could be laid up in a bed right now, but you're here. God has empowered you. Everything you do, everything you accomplish, your ability to think, to read, to write, to work, to flow, to make decisions, to love, it all comes from the source. He's our father. But if you don't recognize God, you're my dad, you're my father, it's on you. And we try to do it in and of ourselves. that's where we get in trouble. God is saying, I am the source in your life. I want to come back to this later on in the series, but I remember before Lauren and I started the Block Church, and some of you have may have heard some of these stories, but I think they're pertinent because we haven't done a finance series in a long time. But as we were starting the church, and again, I'll come back to this and tell you some more about it, but I remember as we were starting the church, a woman called me and she said, I know you have school loans and I know they're debilitating. And for you to start this church, God told me to take care of those school loans for three years. So for three years, an $850 check showed up faithfully. I'm not my source. Only he can do that. I didn't even know this woman. You think God doesn't have it in the bag? But it takes a surrendered heart. See, Father God would say to you, child, I got this. I'm your source. Second thing that I believe the father would say to us is you got to do your part. You got to do your part. Like, like this is a partnership. Like I, th this is, this is me partnering with you. It's what I do. It's who I am. And in third John verse one it says, beloved, I pray that in every way you may succeed and prosper and be in good health physically. Amen. Just as I know your soul prospers spiritually, just as I know. Now, I think that's important for you to know that this is the writer in the scriptures saying that I want you to prosper in every single way. I want your soul to prosper. And I believe that as your soul prospers, other areas of your life will also prosper. Because when our soul is in decay, when our soul is broken, oftentimes physically, emotionally, our relationships, how we live, we're broken in those ways as well. And so the writer is saying, I want you to prosper. And I believe Father God, as a good father, is sitting going, look, I'm looking at you, son and daughter, I want you to win. 
I want you to be victorious. And sometimes I allow trouble and sometimes I allow or I use calamity in your life, pain for good and for your good. But overall, some of that that you go through, right? As you experience victory in the midst of those things, you will prosper. But the thing is, is some of us think that prosperity and winning has everything to do with money. But I know a lot of people who are rich, but poor. And I know a lot of poor people who are very rich. So, so being wealthy doesn't really have to do with what's in your hands. Being wealthy has everything to do with what's happening in your soul. And you're like, oh, that's easy to say, but I ain't got no bread to pay for nothing. Right, but it starts with our soul. And I believe in Jesus' name, the spirit of poverty. And I believe a spirit and an idea of consistent uh, mammon and brokenness and generational, all this stuff. I believe it can be broken. Yes. But we got to do our part. We got to do our part. Let me give you some examples of some rich people that don't have cash. Go back to that scripture, Acts 3, verse 6. But Peter says to someone who wants to be, he, who, somebody who's asking for money, he says, I don't have no silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. So Peter's going, look, I got something better for you than money because money's the quick fix. Like, like me giving you some silver and gold right now, it, it, it might buy you a meal, but I want you to rise up and walk so that you can go produce your own meal. See, doing your part is partnership. I love this passage in the scriptures. It says, better to be poor and dishonest or and honest than to be dishonest and rich. In other words, God is like being very clear, like nothing wrong with money and nothing wrong with you having money. But if your soul's in decay, man, you'd rather just be living on the street and happy than living in a mansion and miserable. He, I mean, he's saying, look, it's about the soul. It's about the heart. And like, if you want to win, then you got to do your part. And trust me, because miracles is partnership. Yeah. I mean, if you look at Moses standing at the precipice of an ocean, he had to go to Egypt. He had to go face his fears and do some stuff before he saw some oceans part. If you go through the scriptures, everybody that did something significant did something significant. Think about that. Everybody who did something significant did something significant. They did their part and they watched God do what they couldn't do. That's how this works. Do your part. Our father, he wants us to succeed in life and experience prosperity in our soul. He's always looking to partner with us and that's how we secure the bag. That's how we have security financially is if we trust that this is a partnership. He's my source He's my strength. He's how I work. He's why I work. And I'm going to do my part in the midst of all the things that I'm facing. Oh, but it's so much. You don't know the kind of debt I'm in. You don't know the family I come from. And no, you can't help being born poor or being born into poverty, but you don't have to finish that way. <laughs> Kingdom principles will always lead us to our best life. Now, 2 Thessalonians says this is powerful, and I'm going to step on some toes with this one, but it is what it is. For even while we were with you, Paul writes, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Mm. I heard a lot of mmms. <laughs> Look at your neighbor. No, I'm just kidding. Don't. <laughs> but like... Now, now, what Paul's referencing here is it applies to people specifically who can work or otherwise contribute to society, but choose not to. Okay, so I want to be clear about that. There are certainly circumstances and situations where it would be impossible and unhealthy for someone to contribute emotionally and physically to society in that way. However, Paul is absolutely communicating, if you can offer something, you can offer something. And there is a responsibility to offering something. We are Christians, man. We should be the most innovative. We should be the most creative. We should be the hardest workers. We should have the most integrity, man. The greatest things should come from us because we have the creator of the universe living inside of us and living through us. We are not to be entitled people waiting for somebody to bail us out. I'm just waiting for somebody to hook me up. I'm just waiting for somebody to take care of this. I'm looking for a rich man, you know, whatever. Like, I don't know. Or I'm waiting for the government. To, I'm not waiting for those things. I'm doing my part. 
You'll never secure the bag. Listen to me. You'll never secure the bag if you're trying to get a quick fix. And a lot of times that's what a handout is. It's a quick fix. It's, oh, give me money. I need a meal. I need a meal. And God's saying, no, rise up and walk victoriously and have people follow you as you follow Christ. Have people see what I can do. We need to get on a budget. More on this later in the series. We need to build margin. More on this later in the series. We need to go to financial workshop. We need to sign up for the, for the financial one day. We need to go to FPU. Some of us need to declutter and eliminate certain things and just go through our house and just get rid of stuff that we're not using. Do a yard sale or a garage sale or whatever sale or a stoop sale or whatever we do here. We need to declutter because sometimes this helps our mind think. We need to drop our four or five streaming services. Thank you, Amazon Prime and Netflix and Disney Plus and Apple this and this. Like we got to drop some of those. We don't need them all if we don't need them all. Maybe just one. Watch something twice. <laughs> More on this later in the series. We need to commit to getting out of debt. See, too many times we think someone needs to bail us out or do something for us when what we need is someone to instruct us and show us how to help ourselves. And some of you listen to me, look at me. Some of us, we've never been taught. So grace upon grace. But here's the thing. You're going to sit in these services and then you're going to be responsible. You're going to hear the word of God and the voice of God. And now you're going to be accountable. But Father God is saying, fear not, worry not. It's in the bag. I'm not washed up. I'm not worried. I'm not tired. I'm not afraid. I got this if you'll let me because I'm daddy God. Right? I'm your source. Do your part. Here's the next thing that I believe the father would say to us is I want your heart. I want your heart. See, God doesn't want our money. He wants our heart. We take and we receive offerings every week but what we're doing here is we're saying, hey, would you open up your heart and would you put it in the plate? Because God does not want your heart and or your soul to be decayed. And sometimes when we live in fear and trying to secure our own bag, we only lose it. So when we receive the offering, we're saying, come on, give your heart away. And as you give your heart away, God will take care of your life. Too many of us think that God or the church just wants our money. He uses the idea of money to correct our heart. The reason so many of us, listen to me, are offended right now, struggle to give, have money problems, or even have issues with the church or distrust is because we have a heart problem. We have a heart problem. Now, I want to be clear about something. Some of us, we grew up in horrible churches. Can I just be that honest? I mean, abusive churches. And I'm not saying this church is perfect and, and far be it from me to ever make that proclamation, okay? But we are certainly doing all we can to be accountable and utilize resources the best we can. I'm telling you, we can squeeze a lot out of a little because we do. But I get it. Some of you are like, I don't, man, I can't trip. Man, people have messed me over. I, there's one gentleman in our church, he told me this a couple years ago. This cracks me up. It's not funny, but it's funny. And he said, man, the last church I was at, when they take the offering, I was like, you know what? I'd rather go in my, the back of my house. I'd rather get a bowl, go get cash, throw it in the bowl, light the bowl on fire and say, here's my offering, Lord. <laughs> because that's how bad of stewards the church was that I was in. And I'm like, aren't you glad you're not in that church anymore? Right, and so I get some of the fear. I get some of you have been messed over by friends and family and you've tried and you've done this and you've tried to be generous and it's only hurt you. But God's saying, listen, I want your heart. There's something I want to teach you in the midst of all this. Something I want to do in you in the midst of all this. Now listen to this. Jesus talks about money more than he talks about love. What? More than Jesus talked about love, he talks about lo money. Eleven. Of the 39 parables, stories Jesus tells are about money. 11. In fact, listen to this. Most, money is the most talked about topic besides the kingdom of God in the New Testament. The most talked about. 
And more, listen, this is crazy, more than heaven or hell money is talked about. What? What? Why is that? Is it possible that God's actually not interested in money because he owns all the cattle on a thousand hills? God's not worried about money and he doesn't need yours. What God deeply desires because he's our good father. He's like, I want your hearts. And it starts with money because we find our security in it. We're trying to secure our bag. We're trying to get as much. Culture tells us, get as much as you can. Do as much as you can to provide and take care of yourself and make sure you're good and make sure your retirement's all of these things. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be good stewards, but what happens is we get obsessed with securing our own bag and our bag becomes an idol and we miss God in the midst of it. And look what Jesus says. He says, don't store up for yourselves material treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart, your wishes, your desires, that on which your life centers will be also. See, Some of us, our whole life is centered on what we buy. It's centered on coffee. It's centered on entertainment. It's centered on shoes. It's centered on clothes. It's centered on stuff. It's centered on dates because we're obsessed with romance, with people rather than romance, with gods. All of these things, like where our money goes or where our treasure is, our heart isn't God's thing. I don't care about money. I want your heart. But this is where it starts. Like I think about my son. Like when my son one day is an NFL star, I prophesy. (laughs) When he makes millions and millions, like, yeah, of course, man, take care of pops. But you know what I want more than that? I want my son's heart. I want his trust. I want that more than anything. I want to be able to sit face to face and for us to look each other in the eye and for him to trust my decision making and for him to trust my influence and for him to do some of the things that I say that are going to keep him from trouble. Like I want my son's heart more than what my son does. And that's what God's saying to you today. I want to arrest your heart because I love you. I don't want to guard you. And when your soul prospers, your life will also. That's what I want. That's what I'm about. And guys, giving and practicing generosity is such a big deal because it releases your heart into the master's hands. In other words, where you spend money or where you give money reveals what's in your heart in your heart. And God often releases more to those who are fully surrendered. When we bought our house before we started the church or right after we started the church, I saw the house and I saw the size of the living room. And that was my only interest was how big the living room was because I said, we have got to do church in the living room. I got to have people over. We got to have meetings. I got to host people. God, this house will be yours. And then I saw the price. And I said, God, this house can only be yours. It's never going to be mine. (laughs) But, you know, sometimes you just got to be a little gutsy, have a little grit, and believe that he's the source. I got to do my part. So I wrote them a letter. (laughs) Kind of made me think of an old R&B song. I wrote them a letter, and I said, I said, so you don't know me. And I'm a pastor, probably doesn't mean anything to you in this day and age, but like, you know, I'm starting a church in the neighborhood and like, this is all I got. So like, I know your house is, you know, you bought it for more than what I'm asking, but you know, I mean, just in Jesus name, can you hook a brother up? (laughs) And then they accepted my offer. Because God knew every square inch of that place would be used for his glory. And it has been. And people come and people receive healing and life. See, when I'm saying, God, you have my heart and all the stuff, all the materials, it's yours. 
all of it. And then God just releases more on us because he can trust us. Some of us are stuck because we don't trust God. And so God can't trust us with more. What's your heart? What's your heart? God is looking for romance. And what I mean by that, he's looking for love. He's looking for self-abandonment. What is true romance? It's when you're sitting at a picnic and you don't need a bunch of stuff and you're happy. Right? You don't need a bunch of, you know, fine wine and cheese. You just need each other. Some of that stuff helps, but you know what I'm saying. (laughs) And God's going, God's going, I just want to be with you. I want your heart. I'm dad. Here's the last thing I think Father God would say is you got to choose your family first, son or daughter. And I don't mean like your brothers and sisters or, or, you know, abuela or... Or the niños or hermanas and hermanas, okay. Yeah. Dios le bendiga, okay. <laughs> See, Jesus talks about in Luke 14, 26, he's basically saying, like, if you love others, and that is even in comparison, if you love your family, even in comparison to how much you've abandoned yourself to me, then, like, you don't get it. Like your love for the kingdom of God for me, and part of loving me in the kingdom of God is, is, is taking care of your home. Believe that. But like your love for me and your trust in me, that must supersede all things. And, and Jesus, he's going, look, in Matthew 6, 33, but first, somebody say that, but first, every location. Come on, poor everybody, again, but first. And most importantly, seek, aim, strive after his kingdom and his righteousness In other words, his way of doing and being right, the attitude and character of God, and all these things, all the things will be given to you also. What Jesus is saying, and stay with me, is he's going, look, I give you the desires of your heart. Sometimes, as you give your heart to me, I change your heart, and when I give it back, you want different things. Come on, how many after you gave your life to Jesus, you used to want some different, you used to want some stuff. But now you want some different things. And he's saying, if you seek me first, if you choose the family of the kingdom of God first, I got you. I got this. It's in the bag. And Jesus goes on. He says this. This is a tough one. He says, if you cling to your life, you're going to lose it. If you try to hold on to that bag, if you're greedy, if you're just, oh, if you're fearful. But if you give your life for me, you will find it. Yes, I we secure the bag. We say, God, I got these talents. I got this stuff. I got these bags. Like, here, I trust you with it more than I trust myself. God's going, don't you know I'm the creator of the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and humans? I can do all things. I am all things. I'm everywhere. I'm all knowing. I'm all present. I'm all powerful. I'm God of the universe. If you give me your bag, wait to see what happens when I give it back to you. Come on, somebody. Anybody trusted God with their life know exactly what happens when we surrender our heart. He gives us back way more than we could ask dream or imagine see the first of our income our energy our resource it goes back to God through the local church what he's established through a healthy Bible teaching spirit led local church that's how we put the kingdom and our family first and I'll be more practical about that as the series continues but I want to close with just a minute left with a beautiful story of people that put the kingdom of God first. And I asked them to share this story, but Simon and Chelsea, Simon, our business administrator, volunteer business administrator, by the way. I met him at a conference several years ago and I liked him. We had a good interaction and I, we stayed in touch and, you know, periodically, but I called him before we started the church and I said, hey, Simon, why don't you move to Philadelphia? He's like, who are you again? You know, like... He's like, Philly, I live in like Harrisburg or something. I don't know where he was. And, but I said, why don't you just come for a weekend? Just, just hang out with us. I'll take you to dinner and 
I'll show you Philly, you know, whatever. And uh, that's how I get you, by the way, I'm telling you. <laughs> if we eat, you're in, okay? So we go to dinner and then I'm like, hey man, tomorrow we're gonna go hang out door hangers in, in the neighborhood. And it was August, it was a blistering hot. And Simon's out there sweating, walking around with his wife. And I'm like, man, at least we had some help for the weekend. He ain't coming here. And after he said, I think I'll be back next week. I think, I think God might be calling me to move to Philly. I'm like, okay, I know, like, have you ever been to Philly before? He was like, yeah, I think that was like my first time or something, you know. He's like, God's speaking to me. And, and, and when Simon arrived, man, he needed a job, like desperately. I mean, they, they came here and found an apartment and started contributing, but like, God, where you at? Like, I got bills. And like, at that time of our church, we were not in a place where we could just take care of people and things. I mean, we hadn't even started yet. And so Simon came and, and, and he started to find jobs and get connected and trust God. Now, Simon and Chelsea practice what we call tithing. That's giving the first 10% of their income back to God. But they do something even more extra than that because they're passionate believers and they're over the top about how they love God. And they're also practicing radical generosity. And so every year they've been married, they give a percentage more. So they give 17% of their income back to God through the local church. That's what my wife and I are practicing, 17%. I hope that one day I'm giving 90% of my income away. A reverse tie. That's my goal. And, and Simon, though, and Chelsea came here. Ready for this? But on top of that, even amidst their faithfulness, came here with $255,000 worth of debt. Did you hear me? Can you even fathom that? I don't even know if I've made $250,000 in my whole life. <laughs> Got it together. You know, like, it's like, okay, I'm being funny, but like, it's like, it's like, it's like, what? Yet they kept giving. They kept showing up. And Simon and Chelsea have been faithful over the years, over the years, faithful, doing their part, trusting God as their stores, being generous, never stop giving, never stop serving, faithful, 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 faithful. And today, they only have $52,000 of debt. Come on, somebody. You think God doesn't have this in the bag? And Simon believes, they believe that over the next year and a half, two years, and he thinks they can be completely debt free. I'm telling you, you don't think God can do it? You're crazy. God can, and he will. Yes. That's the kind of God we serve. And so I'm not trying to say this, and I think this is powerful. He says, if we take care of God's house, God's going to take care of ours. In other words, man, when you do God's business, God does yours. Do you believe that he is our source? And I say here today before you're going, I know that only God could do what he's doing. I don't want to try to do it on my own. I want to trust in him. And I want to give you over the series an opportunity for you to take care of God's house. Here's what we're believing for as a church in this series. We're believing that our monthly income as a church increases $25,000 a month. Here's what it will do. It will cover not medial, but medical for our staff. Our staff right now, we are not helping them with insurance. I know you care about your pastors and love them. And part of you caring about them is helping that they can go to the doctor. It creates room for us to carry our first mortgage, which we are looking to do soon. We're working on it. And also, it ha helps us add additional staff, which is needed because there's a lot of people who might be slipping through the cracks, not being pastored because there's a, not enough administrative support. And so when you take care of God's house, God's business, man, God takes care of yours. I can guarantee it. And over the next five weeks, not only are we going to teach you how to give and live, but we're going to teach you how to thrive and secure the bag. I believe God's in this. Don't miss a week. Can we give God a praise today? Every location. God, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for all you've done and you're gonna do. Would you stand up uh, to your feet every location?